So the webinar is now broadcasting. Welcome everyone to this wonderful launch of November Rain by Jane Jennings. This is her second Charlotte Frain novel. And um, it's, dare I say, better than the first. No. <laughs> <laughs> they keep getting better, Ma Maureen. They keep getting better. Um, the, uh, the first one wasn't very good. Never mind. Go on. No, no, it was very good. Um, the, this launch is co-hosted by Sleuth of Baker Street and uh, the wonderful store um, run by JD and Marion. And uh, we appreciate their uh, really supporting um, Maureen supporting the sales of Heat Wave, the first Charlotte Frame book, and November Rain, and the role they play in the murder mystery society. They are really, they are terrific. They, they put authors in touch with publishers, they put publishers in touch with authors, and authors with authors. Um, they are an amazing store, and um, they have many, many copies of November Rain, and if you order your copy from them, there'll be a card at the end that tells you where you can order from. Um, they can arrange for Maureen to come into the store and sign copies of the book. Uh, this evening is going to be a conversation between Vicky Delaney and, and Maureen. Um, the conversation will last about 30 minutes and will be followed by questions which can be submitted via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. So uh, please type in any questions you have. I will monitor them. And when the conversation is over, I will uh, enter the, the fray and I will uh, ask questions on behalf of you, the audience. Um, so now for the introductions. Vicki Delaney is one of Canada's most prolific and varied crime writers and a national bestseller in the US. She has written more than 30 books, clever cozies to gothic thrillers, to gritty police procedurals, to historical fiction and novellas for adult literacy. She's currently writing three cozy mystery series, the Sherlock Holmes bookshop series for Crooked Lane, the year round Christmas mysteries for Penguin Random House and under the pseudonym of Ava Gates, the Lighthouse Library series, also for Crooked Lane Books. Maureen Jennings, who is uh, our darling, <laughs> and whom we are celebrating tonight, is the author of the Detective Murdoch books, which have of course been adapted to what I think is turning out to be one of the longest running television series in Canadian television. Um, Murdoch Mysteries is I think it's in its 13th season now. 14. And, and shows no signs of letting up and is providing many people with a very healthy income. <laughs> uh, is delighting audiences, not only coast to coast to coast, but around the world and in multiple languages. Um, Maureen is also the author of the Tom Tyler and Christine Morris books. Her books have been translated into many other languages, including Polish, Korean, French, German, Italian, and Czech. She was awarded the Certificate of Commendation from Heritage Toronto in 1998 and the Grant Allen Award for ongoing contribution to the genre in 2011. She's received a total of eight nominations from the Crime Writers of Canada for Best Novel and Best Short Story of the Year. I'm going to now mute my mic and turn this over to Vicki, who will unmute her mic and off we go. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you to everybody for joining us. I can't see your faces, but I know you're out there listening to us and I appreciate very much. And I know that Maureen does. I have one quick correction. I'm actually the author of four series. Mark didn't mention the Tea by the Sea series from Kensington, but that's okay. Um, anyway, so I have read Maureen's two books that are published by Cormorant and I just love them particularly evocative to me is the time and we're definitely the time and the place and I'm definitely wanting to hear more about that. So first of all, I'd like to ask Maureen, these books are set in the 1930s. I think it's what, 1937, 1938, the series begins. So my, I'd like to know what is the initial appeal of the time frame of these books to you? It's the 1930s, it's in Toronto, the depression is raging, World War II is looming, people are still suffering from the effects of World War II. 
World War I, sorry. So it's unquestionably not a cheerful time. So why did it appeal to you as um, someplace you wanted to write about? If I start talking, then it'll switch to me, right? Okay. Before I get, I, I'm so distracted by all these wonderful notes that are coming through. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's amazing because we have from Ireland, UK, Spain, these are my friends, uh, uh, and it's really lovely. So, and like Vicky, I wish we could see you. I wish I could see you, but I, I know that you're there and I really appreciate it. So back to Vicky's question, it's actually 1936. And I chose that deliberately because I, when I start writing a book, I do what I call cast a wide net. net. And as I was looking, I knew it was going to be in that period, more or less. And then I read a lot of the contemporary newspapers. And in July 1936, there was a heat wave that hit Toronto. Never before or since has there been such a temperature. 40 degrees at night, which was phenomenal. And I really got... a. a tweaked by that, and that was the title of the first book, is Heat Wave. And I wanted to explore, given that time, and you can imagine with virtually no air conditioning the way we have it now, that it was very, very uncomfortable. And it was particularly uncomfortable if you were poor. Um, and it's those parallels just echo throughout history. So I got very interested in that. The more I read, the more I discovered what an incredibly turbulent time period 1936 was. And I like going to a time period that's kind of on the cusp of change, which is the, how the Murdoch series started. 1895 was very much a period of change, although we think it, it was a stayed time, it actually wasn't. Um, so 36 with heat wave and then getting into what Toronto was like. And as you say, it was nearing the, the depression was easing a little bit, but there were many people who had suffered and were still suffering from that economic deprivation. So very exciting things were happening. And what really intrigued me was as a reaction to that, I think, there was a surge in communism and communism created incredible fear in the establishment. And this was the Red Scare. Uh, and I have a book which I'm just gonna reach over. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, no, I will show it to you, sorry. I can show you things, that's really nice. Uh, sorry, there was the, which we, this is not the book I was gonna show you. This is the riot. <laughs> Pitts. Um, the book that was very interesting to me was a, a play actually called Eight Men Speak. And it was considered seditious. Now I have no idea if in today's world we would ever label a play seditious, but sedition was still a criminal offense. So the play was- can you, can, you define, can you define how you see um, sedition for us? Encouraging treason, is that not what it is? That's what yeah. I think. They, well, the play, I think, yes, I got the play and I thought, okay, again, what is sedition? What, what, why was this so upsetting to everybody? The play was played once only, not far from here actually, and it was immediately closed down. But the play was about uh, particularly a man called Tim Buck, who was a communist and had sent, been sent to prison because at that time communism, to be a member of the Communist Party was illegal because you wanted to overthrow the government. And that's where the sedition came in. So the play, which is rather a good piece of drama, was simply about questioning this, um, uh, uh, this uh, criminal offense. And I found that really interesting. So that's why that time period just started to go, ooh. And uh, I set the, the first book and the second book, fictional time, they're only a few months apart, heat wave 
and now this one, November Rain. So that really intrigued me. And the fact that although World War I was finished, the ripples and the repercussions were still going on mm -hmm. as they do in terms of the returning veterans, the effect it had had on society. So I like putting, I like getting into all that stuff, and putting it in there. Yeah, and you do a really, really good job in both those books about discussing the thing about the veterans. And I, I you know, in fact, they were generally not treated all that terribly well, and maybe we'll have a chance to get into that. I mean, they were honored for their sacrifice, but then they were shunned socially if they showed any kind of, any effects from their from their um, their experiences, and nobody wanted to hear about it. Nobody wanted to go near them, and um, and certainly poverty for the whole dogs a lot of them for their whole lives, as they couldn't hold down jobs. So you do a really good job in this book, I think, of of discussing that. Right. So you held up um, the book about the crispy pits, and that's actually a question that I do have. Um, so 1930s, 1936, obviously a troubled time, as we said. Um, so in Heat Wave, the first book in the series, the characters discuss the recent riots at the Christie Pits, and they talk about something called the Swastika Club. I think we can all guess what that is, right. and how bored young, bored young men looking for trouble and finding it when they felt their turf was being contaminated by foreigners. Um, oh, right. I was actually going to read a place, and I've lost it, so I'm not going to... Oh, there it is right here. Okay. Back then they were mostly young toughs, unemployed and looking for trouble. And when a young, aggrieved male and looking for trouble, you're going to find it. What did they have to be so aggrieved about, other than the economy that is? That was secondary. They seemed to leap into action when they felt their turf was being contaminated by foreigners. Ah yes, the eternal other. So my question about that is, are you making a deliberate comment on the political situation in Canada and or other countries today, or are you strictly talking about history? Well, I'm very much with Barbara Tuckman uh, when that wonderful title, The Past is a Distant Mirror. And I really get all hot under the collar about that because I feel as if history is not taught enough that we do not know enough about our history in terms of learning from it. So that was very, I'm very deliberately doing that, yes. And the fact that it wasn't that long ago, 1936 was that not that long ago. Um, and in, it was the Barmy Beach Club, which is a wonderful, respectable club, but they had these little groups who start, and this is prior to World War II, remember, uh, they started to call themselves the Swastika Clubs. And in the Christie Pitts riot, um, there was a baseball game going on between a primarily Jewish team and a primarily Italian team. And these tufts stood up in the stands with a huge banner, which said, Heil Hitler, and there was a swastika on it, which was already people were knowing what the swastika meant. They started apparently to shout Heil Hitler or Hail Hitler, more correctly. So the Jewish team in particular uh, weren't going to stand for this. They were young men too. So they went for the banner and the huge riot ensued and it caused a lot of some good repercussions um, because thank goodness at that time, the mayor of Toronto said, you, we're going to forbid any such display of controversial signs like that. And so they just went underground and called themselves the Barmy Beach Peace Association, which I thought was terribly ironic. But apparently uh, the mayor of Toronto, Draper, was terrified of communists. And, for, and there was a lot of fusion in people's minds with Jewish and communists. And so he had got most of his police officers somewhere else monitoring a union, a peaceful trade union meeting. They were trying to get some employment and recompense. They were over there. So there are only like, I don't know, three of at the most police officers at the pits 
although they'd already been warned. So it just escalated, couldn't control it, rippled everywhere. But I felt that was one of those funny things that got a consciousness raised in the city. And I think that's always good. A sense of like, we can't allow this. We can't let this happen again. So even though that's earlier in time, that was 1933, than my book, I still felt these things, as I say, ripple through society. So I wanted to mention them and the conflicts that were simmering. And then of course, broke out so atrociously in Germany in 1939. Wow. And, and, but it was, a, I guess what surprised me was that it was already kind of starting there people were, and I'm not, I didn't make this up. It was already people were saying, there's going to be another war. And I, yeah. thought, I was surprised at how early people were thinking like that, 1936, three years earlier, but the troubles were definitely, yeah. uh, as Churchill called it, the gathering storm was already there. And I found that very interesting. Speaking of gathering storms, that's a nice segue into my next question, which is about, to change the topic a little bit about weather. The thing that struck yeah, yeah, right. reading both these books is how important weather is. And so important, they're ref it's reflected in the title, Heat Wave and November Rain. I felt that certainly in the first book, you, the reader really feels that heat, as you said, a time with no air conditioning. Uh, and I just keep thinking of women in their girdles and their stockings and their tight dresses and men in their suits and their ties, and you can't take that tie off. And then, um, then the cold rain of November, and it's November right now, and we all know what the cold rain is like. It's just awful. So is it intended, was it deliberately intended to have weather contribute so much to the book? And is it going to continue to be a, um, uh, such a prominent feature in later books? Yes. Well, as I said, the thing that really tweaked me was this heat wave about which I knew nothing. And, and exactly what you said, if you're wearing something when you're all buttoned up and gloves for women and corsets, you're gonna get even hotter. And apparently what was scandalizing to a lot of people was the fact that the other, the immigrant other were going down to the lake, which was minimally cooler and actually changing their clothes or something absolutely scandalous like that. No, I'm quoting from the newspaper. I really am. But it, it, my heart went yeah. out to them, you know, because we, uh, when we moved into this house, for example, we discovered that there was much more light on the second floor, which is where I am now. So we sort of lived on the second floor. We decided to live on the second floor, which was hotter. And at the time, in a normal summer, we didn't have air conditioning back then. I couldn't even use the third floor. It was too hot. And this was just an ordinary <laughs> house. This was built in the 20s. So you just say, OK, this is what it was like to live. Where would you go? I don't know. There was nowhere to go. Even the lake was not much cooler. And that's very high temperatures, which is not a pet and repeat it, believe it or not. Yeah. So yeah, so I got into the theme of weather. I like, believe it or not, I like writing about the weather. I don't like talking about the weather, but I like writing about the weather. <laughs> I like trying to capture that feeling of those bleak November days where it's so miserable and gray and rainy. So yeah, so the next book is called cold snap <laughs> so i'm trying winter. to <laughs> into winter and, and trying to capture that that feeling of what it's like yeah and people probably struggled in the winter in the opposite way it was expensive to heat your house if you didn't have a lot of money or you didn't have a decent furnace or you lived in a boarding house and the landlady didn't want to pay to heat it and you know and all that stuff so yeah well yeah. again Vicky, typically at the time which was how i grew up the, the, the heating came from one small fireplace. And, and even in England, which it was never that cold, really, but we grew up huddled around a fireplace, which was about, you know, a tiny fireplace. And, and you'd have to get more, more clothes on then. 
and yeah, go to bed yeah. and rush into bed and dive under the covers and things like that. So I'm looking forward to doing all the cold weather. So so thanks. And another thing I really like. No, no, I just right. said I, thank you that it has affected you because I wanted that effect. I wanted you to feel it. Um, was another, another thing I really liked about the books is the cover. So I'm going to show just in, for people out there. This is Heat Wave and this is November Rain. Very similar covers. I really like them. One thing that's struck me is it's very unusual in crime fiction to have an actual picture of a character on the cover. But I think in this in this case, it works really nicely, as I said. So can you tell us a couple of questions? First of all, how involved are you in the cover design? And if you talk about that, can you talk a little bit about the blue bench, which is very significant in this book? Yeah. yeah. Um, I thought that the, the cover was, I've been lucky with covers and publishers. And Mark uh, has a wonderful illustrator. And so we decided we wanted to echo um, the noir times that I'm sort of echoing of um, Ross MacDonald and Dashiell Hammett and so on. So I think we're deliberately trying to imitate that. And I, I thought it was a super job. And the November rain that, if I may put it this way, that bloody blue bench was so heartbreaking um, because again, one of the wonderful things about writing historical books, I'm always learning. I'm going in a certain direction, but there are so many other things that I discover. And I was very interested in the returning veterans and the fact that so many of those young men came back mutilated and there wasn't, there was cosmetic surgery, but not a lot. And one of the ways that the city tried to, on one level anyway, empathize and sympathize with them, they designated certain benches, blue benches. They were painted a bright blue. And so a returning veteran who might look hideous was, could have his privacy. So that's fine. But what it also did was act as a warning and I kind of put that in the book too. So someone's walking along, you see a blue bench and you see somebody sitting on that bench and you go, whoops, am I going to avoid this because I'm likely to encounter someone who is hideously disfigured, which was the case. So I don't know how long they lasted. I never could find that out actually. I don't, they didn't go on forever and ever, but right after the war, that's what the, they were there. And there was actually, I came across a website where they actually had a photograph of such a bench and it was bright, bright blue. I mean, you couldn't miss it. So I, I thought that was very interesting. The attitude of people, as you said earlier, there was a, like a, oh, let's get on with things. We can't give you very much money. Many of those returning veterans were very um, economically deprived, never mind that they couldn't work. And I felt a lot of sympathy for that. So I tried to put that into uh, November Rain, that they are very prominent in the story, these yeah. men who are injured and returning. Yeah. yeah, and you handle it really well. It's, 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 t it's quite touching. The bench was, and that was a shocker to me. I thought I knew a lot about that time frame, and I didn't, I'd never heard of those. No. And it is a really, like having a, a sign around your neck, unclean. Oh, it's, kind of... it's exactly, it, it wasn't yeah. supposed to be that way, but I'm sure that was there, of course. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I'd like to add this, the series is called um, Paradise Cafe series. It's not called the Charlotte Frame series or Toronto in the 1930s series or anything like that. So why is it actually called Paradise Cafe when in fact Charlotte doesn't even work there. She works for a private <laughs> um, investigation agency. Can you tell us about that? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, well, it's, you know, everything shifts, as you know, as a writer, things tend to evolve on their own. But when I started out, I wanted to write about private investigator who was a woman and 
Oh, sorry, there's a note there. Never mind. I I'll read it later. <laughs> Yvonne remembers blue benches. Oh my God. Oh. Um, so Charlotte as a private investigator, which in itself was really interesting because women at the time were not detectives. They were they could be on the force, but that for a long time it was women looked after women and children. Fine, that's fine. So but I wanted that and then I started to again get material about prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think of prisoners of war of the Second World War, where we know there were notorious, yeah. horrible stories. But there were also prisoners of war in the First World War, a lot actually. And I came across um, something somewhere, which the prisoners of war were starving they never were given very much food. And so they began to, apparently when they were in their barracks, they would talk about food. Now, initially I thought that was, I couldn't imagine that. I think if you were really, really hungry, you wouldn't want to talk about food. But since then, no. many people have said, no, that's not the case. In both, and a lot of people have said when you, that for these men, they were very hungry. And so they would talk about food that they had loved. And so I, I was very intrigued by that idea. So in fiction, these four men decide that when they are released, if they are ever released, they will make a cafe. Because what they'd say is, I would eat that bacon sandwich and the egg would run down my chin and it would paradise so they decided to call this cafe the paradise cafe and i really liked the idea and i put a little note at the beginning because i'm i love my morning coffee and i'm lucky to have people who know me and i know them so i literally as i put that in the book you the paradise cafe is the place where you go and they know your name and all you have to do is say, I'll have the same. And I, I love that concept. I love going in and, the, and Pam says, same, yeah, the same. So that was how it started. And I want that cafe to be in like a character in the book. And um, sometimes more prominent, sometimes less prominent. But in November rain, I was very glad because the cafe, they decide they're going to put on this play. So it gave me a chance to advertise Eight Men Speak, it's called. I wish we could remount it. I think it's worth remounting for sure. And so that gives me a lot of room to bring in characters. So it's going to be there all the time. And that's why I'm calling it the Paradise Cafe series. It's very evocative as well. I actually like the cafe a lot the uh, the way that these people line up for what is effectively not a very nice meal in fact you know the soup in particular you describe how nobody likes it um, you know and they pay their little bit of money and if they can't pay their money nobody kind of you know makes a big deal out of it and then they all shuffle out again and the next lot shuffle in and it's quite I guess it's quite evocative of to me that was the really evocative of depression yeah the way that they gathered at that cafe yeah. Right. It's a sort of soup kitchen, really. And, and again, that was a bit easier to handle as a writer, uh, that they have these shifts and they come in and they get their special of the day. And then I have a wonderful book, which I forgot to pick out, but it's a book of recipes uh, for the uh, sales ships, it is. And, and it's that time period. So I've been looking at the recipes. I don't think I've made any. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, oh boy and, but it's uh, recipes i sometimes I, I love to preach this a little bit because recipes books and instruction books if you want to know what a time period was like you just go Absolutely. into recipe books um yeah. or, or the instruction books so yeah. you, the recipes are a scrag of mutton yeah. The neck, right? 
<laughs> just this is way aside i'll think real quick there's a really good show on netflix called lords and ladles in which they recreate a english or an irish country house menu as it was done well worth lives. lots of fun anyway what? that's way off topic because i don't want to ask. It's not, no it's not it's you can write to, me, write to me later i hear about it um murdoch's son jack is an important character in the charlotte frame books so how important was it to you that you continue with the Murdoch family line? It's, it's very important. And I, again, I'm sure that writers will understand this and readers will understand it, that when one starts creating characters, they become completely independent of you. So it sounds weird to say, oh, I really like that character. But as the omniscient writer, I have literally at times said, I should kill you off, but I won't. So Murdoch is such an important character for what he's done. And I like the fact that in the last book that I wrote, his son returns from the war, for, uh, it's 1917. And I like that continuation it, it just keeps it alive for me. I, I'm trying to create a world that is believable. So to have a family sort of ongoing felt believable. So, and I, and it's, I hope nobody thinks I'm being conceited, but to say, I like Jack, <laughs> I like him. Come back, Jack. And Mur Murdoch's gone away. He's gone to Nova Scotia because he'd be 70 now, but anyway. So, okay, let me ask you a more general question here. Yeah. Um, what is it about the recent historical period that appeals to you? So the Murdoch books are set in the late 19th century, the Tom Tyler series in World War II, and now the Paradise Cafe series in the 1930s. And all of which I would say are, are historically speaking anyway, reasonably recent. So why does that appeal to you rather than say the Tudors or the Reformation or even Loyalist Canada? Um, good question, actually, Vicky, because when I first began writing, which would be 1895, I consciously wanted to have it close enough that I might literally be able to see it. And that, at that point, that was, you know, 1895, because it was enough, not now, but enough of Toronto that remained that I could literally, and I did, walk along uh, Sherburn Street or Beverly Street and you could see the architecture. And I've always felt when you really look at architecture as it was, you can understand the life behind that. There's the family in the front, there's the narrow little staircase that goes up to the tiny rooms where the servants and the children lived. That's all you need to know about the dynamics of that society. Obviously not all you need to know, but. So I was very aware of that. I, I loved the Tudors, I, I loved that period, but I knew I couldn't feel close enough to it. I couldn't walk around and say, oh, wow, you know, or hold necessarily hold something that someone had held that long ago. And as I've moved on, I mean, the Tyler series are actually closer in time, but the 36th period also feels really close, especially in Toronto. And I, I, I find it's more alive for me and not a lot has changed. And sometimes that's distressing and sometimes that's okay. You know, you say, why hasn't it changed it? the bad things? But no, I, I really like to live in a place. And I think that's why those show that you mentioned, they're so successful. And I think perhaps we, most of us like to live there, you know, let's try on that corset or let's put on that sword. Swords were so heavy. As soon as you pick up a real sword, you go, wow, that was heavy. So that's why. Any other questions? And wearing a sword, every time you turn the corner, you'd whack something. <laughs> What's that? One last question, I think, and then I think Mark's... Said... What's that? Oh, I said, I've got one last question, because I think Mark's wanting to turn it over for Q&A. So my last question is going to be about historical research. 
because you're famous for your historical research and it adds so much to the books. But what impressed me on reading the Paradise Cafe books and your other series is I feel the amount of historical detail you're putting in is just right. It can be really easy to want to let the reader know every fabulous detail that you've learned about this time period. And essentially that drowns out the actual plot. You've managed to make a really fine balance between creating historical feel, but yet moving the plot. Is that something or does it just happen to you? I mean, basically, do you have to control yourself? <laughs> I learned it. Believe me, I learned it. Book one, great globs of stuff that I'd learned that I wanted to share. And I had a very wonderful, tactful editor at that time, Ruth Cavin, and she tactfully suggested I sort of sprinkle it as opposed to globbing it in. And I've learned that because there are so many things that excite me and I want to share them. But if it's too much in a clump, then it's like, mm. So I am writing a book and I'm writing a mystery book. So I, I've really learned that. So thanks, Vicky, that, that seems to have worked. It's, I, I call it sprinkling, a little salt as opposed to boom, look at this, which is much more interesting. Yeah. It, it is much more interesting, yeah. Um, oh, there's Mark. Continue to just, do you have anything more to, to, to say? Who, me or Vicky? Vicky, Vicky. Oh, we could talk here all night, but I'm just wondering um, how, you know, how many questions you've got. There's certainly more we can talk about, but um, you probably well, have to it, it turns out we have very few questions, but many people are uh, writing congratula congratulatory emails saying congratulations on the launch of your book. They're writing from all sorts of places, including Bedlam. Bedlam. It's in Bedlam. Oh, uh, where? Oh, I'm sorry to be distracted, but I am seeing some names and comments, it, and it's really lovely. It is Lord, truly, truly, it is truly lovely. Um, well, I'm going to say, as as somebody who's edited the last the, the two Charlotte Frame books, um, one of the great challenges for me is there are what I would call bizarre historical details. <laughs> Typewriters. Oh, and boy, spent right. on a Google search for two hours. Um, and lo and behold, there really are electric typewriters. There were electric typewriters in 1936 and 1933. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the joys of working with Maureen is she's forever coming up with these <laughs> details. And oh my God, recipe. <laughs> Right. It, it, food really does play an important role in these books. And um, Rain, do, do you want to talk about some of your favorite cookbooks? Because there's one in particular, I think, that you are very fond of. That was the one I mentioned about the sailing ships. Uh, and it was actually published in 1930-ish. And it's absolutely fascinating. And part of the fascination, of course, is that it's uh, it's limited in terms of what you can do on a sailing ship, or I mean, I'm sorry, not a sailing ship, a steamship. It was, it was a steamship, not a sailing ship. Yes. Um, that was really fun. And the thing that always gets me really excited is these details sometimes where it's like you're stepping through a door or a window and you're in that world. And that's why recipes and um, instruction books really seem to do that. And it's so exciting to step into, okay, an example from that particular recipe book. Um, Cause, and again, it never dawned on me, but you could only carry so much baggage. So carrying a certain amount of water the water was rationed, of course it was. It made total sense it would be rationed uh, for the voyage. And there was a little note that said that the men, the stokers who were down in the bowels of the ship, sweating, pouring coal into the furnace were allowed extra water. And it was just a little comment. Just, you have to give them a bit. And I love it. <laughs> you don't think about you know but all of a sudden 
door opened and there were these guys sweating their heads off, getting a little extra water. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the- Can I just make a, a point? I see some questions are flashing by on the screen, but I think you should remind, yes, they if they are. have a question, they need to go to the Q and A rather than the chat, right? That's right. And Mark- And people, there are questions now. And not just questions, there's some lovely comments that I saw one early on that I think Yvonne said she remembered the blue benches. Blue benches. Yes. Can you do the comments as well or not? Yes. Okay. Well, the first question that I'm going to call out, uh, read out is, Maureen, what got you writing in the very first place besides the historical interests? The very, that, what do you mean, person? <laughs> the very, very, very first place or? Uh, okay. Quick spiel. Growing up in England, fairly working class, it was never on the cards that a female or a male really would be a writer. You would be teacher, secretary, housewife, nurse. Nurse. Not, nurse. Not even for the boys was it a doctor. You know, they did that. It, it was so hierarchical. Um, so it never entered my mind about being a writer, but I read constantly. Books were my uh, solace. They were a place where I went. And I, I love talking to people who are here because I like books, because I think we probably all share that feeling of loving books and loving stories. So that stayed with me for a long, long time. And I think the first story I ever wrote, I was about seven, and I had a little rubber mouse and it bounced into the fire and was consumed. And I wrote on a card, a little thing about how sad I was about my mouse. And my mother was very alarmed. She considered this a very strange sign of morbidity, I think. So I sort of suppressed my interest in death and destruction for a long time. Uh, and then finally said, wait a minute, you know, I mean, again, I'm sure anyone who's ever written, we all understand that initially you don't think anyone's worked at this book. There's the book. It's as it is. Even Shakespeare changed some of his words, which is amazing. But um, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was someone who might have been grappling with whether to call it Winnie the Pooh or Alfred the Pooh or, you know the book comes and that's it. It's irrevocable. And so it took me a while to realize, well, maybe I could write a book and go into that world myself. And that was a long time later, really a long time. I won't say how long, it was a long time. There's, well, there's, there's another question. This is one, it's quite deceivingly simple. <laughs> How do you decide on the names of your characters? That's a very good question. And it is deceptively simple. And the reason I'm very glad to answer this is because I was walking in the park recently with our lovely dog, whose name is Murdoch. And, and somebody said, what is your dog's name? And I said, Murdoch. And he said, oh, Rupert Murdoch. And I go, ah, no. <laughs> and wished forever I hadn't called him Murdoch. But I, oh. I named Murdoch, William Murdoch, because there was a wonderful um, critic called Derek Murdoch, uh, who was writing for this, I think, I don't know which newspaper, I'm sorry, but he was a reviewer. And he was very, very supportive of Canadian crime writing when nobody was. Yep. He passed away, so I wasn't currying favor or anything. So I said, I'm going to name my character Murdoch. I didn't know about Rupert Murdoch at the time. And of course, William, because um, of William Shakespeare. So the naming, and I, I'd love to hear this from Vicky too. The naming of your characters is really important. 
you can't have the same name clearly. And in real life, especially in Victorian times, most people, most men were named John or Charles or William. So you can't repeat the name and you need to reflect the time period in your choice of name. So I wouldn't name a Victorian girl Tiffany, for instance, or Chelsea or Apple or anything like that. So the names you try to reflect that time period reflect something of the character and yeah that's a really good question i could go on and on about it but no it's i i like what vicky what do you do i find it incredibly difficult to come up with names for middle class if you're writing today contemporary stuff middle class middle-aged canadian men mark <laughs> two spellings uh john rob richard you know, there are so few, and you can't have in a book a Rob and a Ron and a Roy. You've got one or the other. And I find, I really struggle with that. Women's names are not so picky. And modern names, like if you're naming a teenager or something, there's all kinds of names. But middle-class Canadian men, oh my God, there's not a whole lot to choose from. No, there's Gord. not. Gord. Gord, no, I have Gords. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maureen? What? Maureen, you should tell everybody um, that in addition to um, naming William Murdoch in part William Shakespeare, um, do you have a particular uh, connection to William Shakespeare? <laughs> oh, Mark, you remembered. <laughs> we share the same birthday, April 23rd. And when I was growing up, um, uh, maybe all children do this, looking for role models. I'd say to my mother, why did you call me Maureen? And her answer was, oh, I, I like the name, which was utterly unsatisfactory. So um, no father, he was killed. So there was William Shakespeare, April 23rd. Oh my gosh, we must be related. And I'd stare at that one portrait. This is rather embarrassing, but I'd stare at that one portrait that we have of Shakespeare, and I decided we had the same eyes. Don't know why. Didn't have the bald head. But anyway, <laughs> the uh, I absolutely wanted to be connected to William Shakespeare, and I still feel that way. I think we are somewhere. So. Yes. Absolutely. Our, our, um, the next question that comes along, it's not in order, but it kind of follows through. Um, from Tanya, she says, thank you so very much for your books with multiple exclamation marks, followed by, can you please comment on the Charlotte character? How was she born? Y yes, um, I, not just the name, I guess, just, just the whole character. Well, that again was, I absolutely consciously wanted to have a female voice because limited by history, I, I, if I'm gonna have a detective, it's gotta be a male in 1895. So uh, to have a female, I had room then because it's 36 to have a female investigator. Um, and then they, again, Vicky, you know this, they, those characters have a way of getting themselves born, you know? Yeah. So, you might start out in a certain way and then I wanted her to be really tall because I'm so short. And so you can do a bit of stuff like that, you know, but uh, I, I think a little bit idealized, you know, saying I would like to have been like that, but then obviously some of one's own characteristics creep in there and they kind of take off. But I have enjoyed, I've enjoyed writing about Charlotte so far. It's nice. It's nice to talk like a woman again. It's the Victorian manner. <laughs> soldier from... Anyway, yeah. Uh, Tanya also has the question. She wanted to ask, why did you use Finland and Finland, co Finland costumes and, 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 and traditions uh, in the book? Uh, clearly, this woman has read November Rain already. Um, uh, do you Sorry, can I answer why I love this question? Yes. Because it was real. And one of the things that I, again, I keep talking about the discoveries, there was a very 
um, important Finnish community in Toronto in 1936. And, and one of the things that I didn't say that I do do, I use a street directory and believe me, it's really interesting. That might sound dull, but it's not. And I literally write down who lived on that street in 1936. I might change the name, I changed the name for protection for them. You don't want anybody knocking on the door and saying, was this where the murder was? Uh, <laughs> but uh, that was, uh, I changed that name, but I really like that concept of the Finnish community and um, that woman in her Finnish costume. I, some, I, some scenes one really enjoys writing. And I, I like that one. And whatever it was, she serves him to drink. It was, a, I've forgotten it now. But anyway, that was, that was fun. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Joan O'Callaghan writes and asks, and tells us there are still people around today who were part of the Christie Pitts riot. I know. Did you interview any of them? I inter Howard Moscow, has written a book about the Christie riots, which I think was his father or grandfather was on one of those teams. So yes, it's not that long ago. Um, or people still remember it being told to them uh, from a, a, a parent or a grandparent or something. Yeah, it seared the city. And now I don't know, we've, perhaps we've lost that sense of intimacy. Toronto was much smaller at the time but it just seared the city. So people do remember it. You know, we won't remember, don't remember the riots in front of the, you know, the city hall or something, but people remember that it was so shocking. Yeah, Toronto the good. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly, yeah. Toronto the good. Um, well, we're coming toward the end of the uh, interview period and the, the entire launch, but, um, there's one question that I think you might want to answer as well. Um, and it kind of takes off from what you said earlier. Um, Barbara asks, did you find it difficult to find a woman's voice after living in a man's head for so many years? No, not at all. <laughs> I liked it a lot. Uh, it was, well, I don't know if it was hard. I mean, obviously I live with the man, you know, and, but it is hard. I think it's hard to cross over and, and say, to really think like a man, it's hard. Um, so it was a relief. It was so easy to just talk about whatever Charlotte talks about, you know, I, it was easy. Thank you, honestly, it was so much easier. <laughs> oh God, anyway. Yep. And it's interesting because you make Charlotte a real character. She's not a knockoff Catherine Hepburn or a wise cracking 1936 mobster mall or anything. She is her own person, yep. isn't she? Right, thank you. No, that, that, was, that was fun. It's been a lot of fun. And, and at some later point, I'd, I'd like to talk about that creative process with anyone who's doing it, because it's really fun. It's really amazing to me how I might start out with this, and then it starts to shift and change. And it is like a relationship with this character. One uh, thing also that, if I may say, that I think it's handled well is you're dribbling out her character uh, her past, shall I say, and past, of course, you know, reflects your character. We know right from the start that she was raised by her grandparents, not her own parents. And that's almost all. She had a failed relationship. We don't really know much about why it failed. And I, so I get the feeling that this is somebody you're going to introduce to us very slowly, like teasing us kind of, which is a good thing. I don't want to dump in the first book about the entire history of this woman's life. So I think that, you know, you're dribbling up, teasing us, dribbling it all in. Yeah. Vicky, very, very, very observant, because in book three, we actually meet very important people in Charlotte's life. Yes. No, I, I must say, it's, I don't have time now, but I learned 
way back when I was writing plays. And I've certainly learned that from television scripts to just do that little bit. You can have a little bit now. It's a bit like a doggy. Come on, have a little bit here and a bit there. And I, I like that re as a reader because I've been a reader first. And then I like to try to do that so that someone says, what happened to her mother? Well, <laughs> just wait. Wait till book three. <laughs> right. um, thank you so very much, Vicki and Maureen. Um, we're going to gently bring this to a close. Oh. I make Absolutely. those final comments. Um, Maureen, do you have any final closing remarks you would like to make? Oh, well, it's been really fun. And, and it's awkward. I find this medium very awkward, but it's great to be able to do it and to feel like we're talking to each other, which is really nice. And I I do want to say hello, because I think I know some of the people who have tuned in and it's late for them. So thank you for staying up late. That's what a mystery writer wants. You want someone to say, I stayed up just so I could read your book. I said, That's great. So, and, and thank <laughs> you, Mark and Vicki, you've been absolutely fabulous. Terrific. Thank you, Maureen. And thank you, Vicki. Um, My pleasure. Lots of fun. Excellent. Uh, it is, it is, we are living in a very different world. Um, but one of the things that, thank God, we still have is books. And Maureen yeah. said earlier, the books were your solace when you were young. And I think right now for all of us, books mm -hmm. certainly be our solace. And I'm going to say um, all, all books are great, but something really good about reading a well-crafted mystery. <laughs> yeah. It takes you through a problem and it usually resolves it. And it makes me personally feel that there is an order to the world. Yeah. And right now, I think we really need that. Yeah. So um, thank you both yeah. for such a wonderful job of providing <laughs> with these books. Um, thank you very much, Chantel Cho, who works for Cormorant Books, who has been our technical genius and uh, made all of this possible. And for all of you out there uh, from Canada, from the UK, not so much, but from Canada, please read your book from Sleuth of Baker Street. I believe- Can I just I make it? I, oh. Yes, Vicki? Oh, I don't know, something happened. Oh, she's put that up, which ties into yes. what I wanted to say. They are telling people if you're mailing presents in Canada to have them in the mail by December the 1st this year because they're expecting the post office is gonna be so swamped. So that's just a little tip to everybody. That's right. And December the 1st is literally around the corner. <gasps> right. Please order your book from Sleuth of Baker Street. The card is up, you can see how to do so. And if you, um, provide the information, Maureen can personalize your book. And um, while you're there, you know, you can buy other Maureen uh, Jennings titles and Vicki Delaney titles as well. Um, and you've got your reading for the next few weeks. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much everyone for tuning in. As Maureen said, a number of the attendees are coming in from uh, the UK, which means it's uh, getting on for one o'clock now. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yes, thank you very much everyone um and have a good evening and take care great thank you very much good night everybody good night everyone <laughs>